Since being diagnosed with ADHD at age 40, I've had so many questions about the signs of ADHD in women, which signs I noticed in myself, what led me to go and to get assessed, what it was like trying to get assessed, what the diagnosis process was like, whether I was gonna get medication, what that process was like. So in this video, I'm sharing my whole process right from when I initially thought I might have signs of ADHD through seeing my GP, the process of actually getting in front of someone to get an assessment, what the assessment was like, and the slight roller coaster it's been trying to sort out medication from deciding if I wanted to do it, and then, well, it's look, it's just been a journey, you're just gonna have to watch the video. Because in this video, I'm sharing that whole journey, so buckle up. I am aware this is a long vlog, and if you do have ADHD, then I understand that your attention may struggle to watch the whole thing but you can come back to it i've put timestamps below as well but please feel free to come back and watch it in chunks if that is easier for your adhd anyway if we haven't met before i am re from mummy of four.com as the title suggests i have four children all of which who were diagnosed with autism and it was not until after they were all diagnosed with autism that i became aware of the signs of adhd in women and started this whole journey. So we're gonna jump back in time now and I'm gonna let past re tell you because as Maria from The Sound of Music would say, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. So I went to the doctors this morning and sat down and he said, what are you, why are you here? What can I help you with? And I honestly thought he already knew where I was there because I had said um, when booking my appointment, but I had to ask him for a referral for an ADHD assessment. So it started a good while ago when, probably a year or two ago, when I did an Instagram live with Katie from what Katie said, where she discussed having been diagnosed, she's almost exactly the same age as me, probably the same school year at school. Um, and she was very recently diagnosed at this point with, I can't remember if it's ADD or ADHD, um, ones with hyperactivity, ones without, I think it's just ADD. Anyway, she reeled off this whole load of lists of symptoms that she had that seem all very unrelated, but that led her to seek an assessment and she then got a diagnosis. Almost everything she said, I went, oh my goodness, I do that. Or, oh my goodness, I used to do that until I put this strategy in place. Oh my goodness, I used to do that until I put this strategy in place. And that was a couple of years ago and I've done almost nothing about it. But if you have seen some of my other recent vlogs, I have uh, started having some therapy sessions for some, let's just say various reasons, to kind of take care of and declutter, if you will, my mental health. And I thought, you know what? While I am having a good old sort out of the insides of my brain, I've always wondered since this conversation, is this something that is a challenge of mine or not? Is it just mum life? Do you know what I mean? Is it just, I'm forgetful and I'm overwhelmed and I find like it hard to wind down and calm down and detangle my thoughts because mum life, because we're all busy and it could just, it could easily just be that. Or is there something else there? And there is neurodiversity in my family, as you know, my children have autism. So I just, I kind of feel like by understanding, yes, this is a challenge of mine or no, it's not, I will understand myself better and therefore know which strategies to put in place. And just, I think when you know what you're dealing with, it's like doing any personality quiz, isn't it? Um, or knowing if you're like a better learner by reading or by listening or by watching, and then being able to kind of play to your strengths. So I did it, I went, I asked him, I thought I was ready for like a big load of quizzing questions then, which I felt a bit nervous about, and he just went, well, I'm gonna give you this questionnaire, fill it out, it was literally a tick box, fill it out and then bring it back and if it's kind of indicates you need assessment, I will refer you for an assessment. So I said, do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do this right now, so I don't forget, because it's kind of one of those things that, I think this is why I hate procrastinating things, because I know I'm just so likely to let them slip off my radar, and I like to do things straight away, so that that doesn't happen, and that's a little bit of a coping strategy. So I literally sat in the waiting room and filled it all out. I will put it on screen, actually. I resonated with, yes, I do, this often to almost everything on there. So I think that probably indicates um, there is enough evidence to do an assessment. Obviously that in itself is nothing. It's, it's just an indicator. Yes, this person needs an assessment or not. So I just wonder if for the sake of my mental health and for the sake of just understanding myself better, that is a sensible thing to do. And also 
if when my children are older they have questions about neurodiversity or whatever and why I got them assessed, whatever it might be, I can say, well, I had queries as to whether I had ADD, ADHD, I got assessed for these reasons and just I think normalising it for my children is probably important. But yeah, the biggest one is just just understanding why I do the things I do sometimes. Like I cannot switch my brain off to do yoga. I find it such a challenge when a thought comes into my head when I'm working not to just stop doing what I'm doing. They go, see there's an alarm going off to go and get my children. So I'm not distracted by what I'm doing when I'm home to go and get my children. Um, but I find it so difficult not to get distracted by what I'm doing by another idea that comes into my head. It takes everything in my being to not just be like, oh, I need to go and do this now. <laughs> because that's what I really instinctively want to do. I really struggle with attention to detail, like proofreading is like, oh, I really struggle with that. Yes, I can go, when I go back to something weeks or months later, I can see mistakes, they're glaring at me. But proofreading my own work, I find a real challenge. Proofreading my own edits, I find a real challenge. That's why I, with the, the bigger vlogs, the ones like the more important vlogs, like trips and things, I will watch them with the t children on the big TV. I watch them back because just looking at the computer, I can't even see the mistakes. Just can't even do it. So there are lots of things. I and mean, um, I think later in this, this video, I will go through my list of kind of specific challenges. But as you know, um, the alarm just went off. I need to go and get my children. And I need to not forget to do that. <laughs> Today is what I'm assuming a, an ADHD appointment. I don't know anything about what's going to be in this appointment. In fact, I think on the letter, it just said psychiatry department. And since I can't think of what else I've got going on health-wise that I could have been referred to, I'm assuming it's an ADHD appointment. The only, the only information I do have isn't terribly positive, and that someone else said that their first ADHD appointment, they came out crying because it was brutal. So, I don't really know what to expect from this. I'm feeling a little nervous, I guess, for that reason. I'm just going to go and do it, and I'll see you afterwards to report back. Back in the car, kind of warm now. That! kind of wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I'm not sure what I thought it was going to be. It was basically a psych evaluation. So what she said was it was to check if the people on the pathway, or I used the word pathway, like they use the autism pathway. She didn't like that. She was like, no, no, no it's just traits. So she, she didn't like the term pathway. Anyway, people on the pathway, people in the system to be assessed for ADHD, to pick up to see if they need any other psychiatric care, if they have any other psychiatric factors at play, severe anxiety. My car is just locking me in. What's going on here? There we go. I've unlocked it so the alarm doesn't go off. Um, so basically just looking for any history of mental illness, depression, sorry, just anything that could be at play. She asked in depth about family history, drug use of which I don't have any, <laughs> um, but she, there were a lot of very detailed questions. She was saying this isn't like, related to ADHD, it's just your general mental health so I answered as honestly as I could um and she said everything seemed fine so the next step is to wait on a really really long waiting list apparently it's going to be over a year for the actual assessment which I think is in a very similar format where I just sit and answer questions she said I could pay to go privately and that would speed it up obviously but if I'm happy to wait then there's a waiting list car why are you keep logging me in she said it all depends like whether it's medication I'm after or just understanding of myself. I think for me, I don't know because I'm open to listen to the experts, but I think I just want to be able to understand my mind. For years and years and years, I have struggled with the juggle and organisation and things. And as, as a teenager, I really wasn't organised and I did all right in school, but I was very disorganised and then as a young adult stuff I just put down to having a lot on my plate but I don't know if it is ADHD I think having that understanding might allow myself to be kinder to myself and I definitely like the idea of if I need strategies for a certain thing to use those strategies it just makes sense and being able to understand my own mind so I'll chat it over with my husband but I don't think I'll pay to go privately why is my car keep locking me in? Um, I don't think I'm going to pay to go privately. I think I'll just wait because it is quite a lot of money. I guess we'll just, we'll wait and see. So um, I'll report back when I hear some, some more. So that was last year. 
And earlier this week I realised, hey, that was quite a long time ago, I should probably chase it and follow it up because if you are familiar with um, my channel, my journey, um, my children all have autism and for each one of them, in order to get them assessed, there was a lot of pushing and nagging and, and I just thought, well, if it was one of the children, I'd make a phone call. So. I'll make a phone call. Got through to someone on the phone who said that it was going to be another two or three years from now. Bear in mind when I originally had a letter, they said it was going to be, what, 10 to 12 weeks for the first appointment, which I had. That was the psych evaluation. And then they said it was probably going to be a year for the second appointment, the second appointment being the assessment. So now, a best part of a year on, it's going to be at least another two to three years. I said, well, that's, that's terrible. What's going on? She said, do you want the number of the complaints department? I said, okay. So I phoned, just left an answer for a message. They phoned me back later that day. So when they asked me what my complaint was, I just said that originally I was told a year, now it was gonna be two to three years from now. It just seems like insanity. It's all felt very reminiscent of when I was having to fight and fight and fight to get my children assessed. Obviously that was autism, not ADHD, but you know, it's all like blah, battling. So they said, no problem, leave it with me. And I just had a phone call to say they scheduled an appointment for me in five weeks time. Just like that. So, I mean, first of all, the moral of the story is squeaky wheel gets oiled. Isn't that terrible? That nothing will get done. And then you get offered a number for a complaints department and suddenly, woo, things happen. Second moral of the story is if you would do it for your children, you should probably do it for yourself. But anyway, um, it looks like in five weeks time, I'm going to be having an ADHD assessment. So what I wanted to talk to you about now, this is a very impromptu video. I wasn't planning on filming now. <laughs> I actually am not filming where I would normally film because I'm in the process of attempting to screen record that interview that I did with Katie from what Katie said from Instagram. And I'm having to do that in a very bizarre way where I'm like trying to record it off my laptop but using the sound of the room. So I've got that playing upstairs and recording to itself in a screen recording. I'm hoping to be able to share that interview in its entirety because that's initially what sparked my oh yeah I do that oh yeah I do that that kind of it's what initially made me think oh all of this sounds really familiar I think I'm just going to if I can manage to post that the sound quality on it's not going to be amazing but I, I think I'm going to post that to YouTube in its entirety just because I felt that what Katie said that <laughs> that's, that's a child name isn't it what Katie said what Katie said to me that day really had a massive impact in me I don't know, just thinking, oh, so maybe not everyone struggles with these things as much as I do. So many of these things that I put down to just mum brain, having lots of children, could really be explained by ADD, ADHD. Okay, so we're going to find the original form on here. Like I said, this is really impromptu and I'm not prepared at all. Okay, so I've got um, on my iPad down here the form that I originally filled in. I just thought I'd go through the questions that they ask in the initial screening that made the GP think, oh yes, this woman probably needs an assessment and made me realize, oh, all of this kind of lines up. So how often do you have trouble wrapping up final details of a project or a task that requires organization? And they ask you to answer never, rarely, sometimes, often, or very often. And you can see if I ticked very often for almost everything. I really struggle with the attention to detail stuff. So the exciting, you know, getting a project done, all that kind of, the creative bit, I kind of thrive on, but the tiny little details, typos and things like, I really struggle to see my own typos. I really, really struggle with. How often do you have difficulty getting things in order when you have tasks that require organization? Now, a lot of these I answered, I really struggle with that, which is why I put this in place. So a lot of these struggles I already have strategies for. I didn't realize they may be ADD, ADHD related, but for example, I've got that clipboard system because I sit down at my desk and I'm like, oh, what am I supposed to be doing? So I've got a clipboard for each of the videos I'm supposed to be doing because some of them I might be editing now, but I filmed months ago. Some of them I need to film today and edit today. It's all I'm trying to get the order in my head is a bit like spaghetti. So I have this clipboard system and they're up in an order. And without that, I just sit down and I waste a lot of time wondering what I should be doing. So when you have a task that requires a lot of thought, how often do you avoid or delay getting started? Uh, so much. Does anyone remember how long it took me to get started with designing my planners? Because I found that really overwhelming. Where do I design it? How do I begin? Which software am I gonna use? How am I gonna, like the process I had to set up of 
how to sell them and how to make the printers talk to the shop to talk to all that I found so overwhelming I figured it out eventually but even getting started on that I procrastinated for so long how often do you fidget or squirm with your hands or feet when you have to sit down for a long time I wouldn't oh, this one's a difficult one I think um while I'm watching tv I find it really difficult to just sit and watch if I'm not also eating or having a glass of wine or scrolling on my phone so from that point of view I find it difficult to just sit and do one thing and I find it really difficult to just concentrate on say yoga where you're supposed to be really mindful or clear your mind and all this business that I find really 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 difficult but then I wouldn't say I'm hyperactive so I don't know that's one for the experts to um look at I guess how often do you make careless mistakes when you have to work on a difficult project if you think of typos my spelling's not dreadful my typing's pretty bad and then noticing those typos really bad really really bad um I really really struggle with that how often do you have difficulty keeping your attention when you're doing boring or repetitive work? All the time. How often do you find difficulty concentrating what people say to you even when they're speaking to you directly? I really do. <laughs> I find myself zoning out sometimes and I think, oh my goodness, I'm not paying attention. Okay, pay attention, pay attention. And then you're like, oh, actually, I'm not listening to what they're saying. I'm just thinking, pay attention, pay attention. So yeah, that's the thing. How often are you distracted by activity or noise around you? Yeah, quite quite easily. If I'm doing boring, repetitive tasks, I do have something on, to, like music or whatever, to keep me company because I'm bored. But when I'm doing editing, things like that, I really find it very easy to be distracted. Like I, years ago, when I worked in a, like a communal office with another probably thirty or forty people in one really big room, I found it so hard to concentrate, like so hard. So I actually do much better working on my own from home than I did in that office environment. How often do you leave your seat in meetings or situations where you're expected to remain seated? That's not a massive struggle. How often do you feel restless or fidgety? Um, okay, and I don't feel like I just can never sit still, but there are times that I find it, re I do find it very difficult to rest then. That I do find it very difficult to do, which brings me on to the next one. How often do you find difficulty in unwinding or relaxing when you have time to yourself? Um, I don't know how to do that. I just, I really, really struggle with that. How often do you find yourself talking too much when social situations? I always worry that I do that. Um, I do. When you're in a conversation, how often do you find yourself finishing a sentence with people talking before they finish themselves? Yeah, I do that. That's really embarrassing. Um, and then I'm like, why did I just do that? That was so rude. Um, but I do that. How often do you find difficulty waiting for your turn in situations where turn taking is required? Yes, I think I worry, um, certainly in like meeting situations where I'd have like an idea or something, I'm worried if I don't say it now, it'll leave my head. And then I'm like, okay, don't leave your head, don't let it leave your head, don't leave your head, if you, like, don't interrupt. But then I'm not listening to what the person's saying because I'm thinking don't interrupt and don't forget the thing you're supposed to say and then I lose place in the conversation. So how often do you interrupt others when they're busy? Mm, yeah, I do that too. So that was a pretty good indication that I need an assessment. Um, the main reasons I wanted the assessment I guess the same as the children really it's just good to know what you're dealing with it's good to know how your brain works because that way you know which strategies to put in place you know when to be kind to yourself you know when to you know push yourself I don't know it's just I feel like the more we know about our brains the better we can be productive take care of ourselves do all the things the better we can avoid pitfalls the better we can manage our struggles and challenges and I guess the other reason is that if the children ever say to me, well, why did you bother getting me ass assessed, you know, then I can say, look, it's no big deal. I went through the assessment too and either nothing came of it or, and I'm also neurodivergent, but just like, I don't know, just destigmatize, I guess, neurodivergence and the possibility of neurodivergence. And so I guess you have to watch this space. Do I have ADHD? Do I not have ADHD? Is it ADD? Will I ever learn the difference? I'm really not as well read up on ADD, ADHD as I am with autism, obviously, because I've done a lot of research into that, to learn about my children. Just kind of diving into the whole ADD slash ADHD. I think the H is just the hyperactivity bit. So my money for me is probably on ADD, not ADHD, because I wouldn't say I've got ants in my pants um, and I can't stay, sit still, having said that. I talk with my hands all the time, which interestingly is something that in the children's autism assessment it was pointed out that children do not talk with their hands. So maybe that's a big difference. I don't, I don't know. Um, how do I feel about it? 
Well, it's not going to change anything at all other than me having a better understanding of me and therefore how I can be more productive, get more done while being less stressed and therefore have more time to enjoy life and be with my children and be a more present parent. I guess that's been what I've been striving for this whole time since I started my channel and indeed since becoming a mother. Life that feels like it's a lot to juggle and I don't think that's necessarily an ADD, ADHD thing. I think that mum life is busy and it is chaotic and a lot is expected of us but I also think there are probably a lot, a lot of women who um, have undiagnosed neurodivergence because ultimately we think of ADD, ADHD as busy and naughty little boys and in girls by all accounts it's more to do with being withdrawn, being quiet, school reports saying things like oh would do so well if she could only knuckle down and concentrate, that was very much me, if she'd only apply herself, <laughs> yeah like I did okay in school, more luck than judgment, imagine how well I could have done if I'd actually been made to apply myself, whether I was made to or not that's a whole other conversation but I know I did not concentrate and um fulfill my full potential then. So you're gonna have to watch this space. I will go to this appointment. I don't know if this appointment is the actual assessment, is like a preamble to the assessment. I don't know if it's like autism for the children where it's multiple different assessments or just a chat and then that's it. I don't know if it's structured, semi-structured. I got no idea what to expect. Um, if you've been through it, please do let me know because I'd love to know what to expect. And if you haven't, keep watching and I'll, um, I guess you'll have to subscribe um, to the channel and just keep an eye out because that video will be coming out. I'll just share what happens because that would be helpful to me right now, I guess, if I could already see what future me has had to go through and know what to expect. So today is the day of my ADHD assessment. I am having very mixed feelings, which... I don't think are even about this. I think they're about other things. I'll explain all that in brief because I have got to head off soon. I have four children, all of which have been diagnosed with autism. And I think the anxiety I'm feeling now is, you know how your brain groups things together? Your subconscious categorizes things. It's like, okay, so this, let's look for a similar experience before. Okay, we'll categorize that together. We're gonna feel the same. And I feel like going for this assessment, I feel a very similar way to the way I did before my children's assessments. Now my children's assessments felt very different. I was fighting for them to get support that they needed in school, so they needed this understanding. So it felt very high stakes. And rightly or wrongly, it felt more important for them really than for me because I'm just me, just them, I'm, you know. So it is different from that point of view. Also, I'd had a massive fight for all of them to get their assessments. It was the end of a very long slog. So I was in very much, you know, if you go fight, flight or freeze mode, the, the modes that you, you can go into, I was very much in fight mode. And then when I came out, I very much went into freeze mode. I felt very overwhelmed. I didn't want to speak to anybody. And I think it was just the result of fight, 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 and then ugh, it, like it's done. And I think it was very similar to, you know how sometimes if you're in a job and you'll work really hard and then the first day of your holidays you get sick. I think it's it was like that. So I shouldn't feel that same way if I'm thinking logically. I'm like, as I'm talking to you now, I'm talking myself through this. I shouldn't feel that same way because it's not the same. This has not been such a fight. Um, if you watched the last video, I will link it below. That explains it all in depth. So I'm not gonna go into this in massive detail now. But in short, I had a chat with a friend of mine, Katie, from what Katie said on an Instagram Live a couple of years ago. She'd recently been diagnosed and everything she said, I went, oh, I do that, oh, I do that too. And since then, I've learned a lot more about it and I resonate with so much of it. So I went to the doctors last year, filled out a form. They said, take this away and bring it back. And I was like, no, no, I'll do it in the waiting room because if I take it home, you'll never see it again. I filled in that form. It very much indicated that I needed to be assessed. And I've had a lot of people saying, well, you don't seem to have ADHD, you're really organized. How much of the organization stuff, I thought I was putting in place to deal with mum life because it was so busy and chaotic. How much of it was just attempting 
to put strategies in place to deal with ADHD? I don't know. I don't know. And the big question has been, okay, but you're a, a functional adult. Why do you need to know? I just feel like I need to understand for my own brain and maybe I can be kinder to myself. It, if I was diagnosed, it would explain so much. I would almost be like, oh, no. I... But then equally, I'm like, what if it's all in my head and I'm just a bit ditzy? I don't have ADHD and I've just wasted everyone's time and everyone's gonna hate me. These are the thoughts that are whizzing around in my head right now that I'm brain farting at you. And I'm aware as I say them out loud, some of them sound a bit silly, but that's how I'm feeling. I'm feeling, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I'm feeling like I would like to get it over and done with now. And on that note, I have to, to leave. It's time to get in the car. Let's go and get this done. And then we'll know when we will, we'll know. And whatever it is, Whatever it will be, will be. Stress out a little bit. Come and find a parking space. Um, managed to find somewhere to park somewhere else. Not always planning to park at all. So I feel a little bit on the back foot. But either way, I'm I'm going to go and do this now. And I will see you on the other side. When I I don't know. Do they give you the results on the day? Or either way, I'll tell you how it all went and. <sighs> Let's go do this. Well, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but I guess I wasn't expecting that. Um, still trying to process. So, as you know, probably from earlier in this video, I did feel, I guess, a little nervous going in. I don't know exactly why, although I've, I've got some ideas of what that might be linked to, some more things that have come up since we spoke earlier um, that I'll share after I told you what happened. So I got there, I was on time, just, only just on time, having not been able to park the car. But then I had to wait around for about 10, 15 minutes, which isn't a massive amount of time, but was enough time for me to be like, I guess I just wasn't knowing what to expect. And thinking about it, yeah, okay, well, I will touch on this now. Yes, I had nervous sort of feelings from perhaps when my children had their assessments. Those felt like quite weighty days. I know when Will, so that was my second child, first one to get assessed. I know his assessments, he had two days of assessments and they were back to back. They kind of squeezed him in last minute. And I was so stressed. I came out in a rash all over my face. It looked like I'd contoured myself in sunburn, like all across my eyes, all across my cheeks. I felt like it was quite a stressful time. And I, yes, I think I associate with that, but also, when I had all my like obs and gyne stuff, that all felt like quite a battle. And I had one doctor that really made me feel like poo and really belittled my symptoms. And I was going through some really debilitating, heavy bleeding things. So this was nothing like that, but I think my brain was just categorizing all that stuff together, which is why I think I was nervous. Anyway, taken into a room, lovely female doctor or psychiatrist, I guess. I don't know, they're all doctors, aren't they? Psychiatrist, is a psychiatrist a doctor? I'm, I'm assuming so. Anyway, so she said that she looked at my psychiatric evaluation because that's the appointment I had last year and that was the pathway they discussed. So when I initially was referred by the GP, I had a letter and a number to phone and I was told that the first one was gonna be the psychiatric evaluation and then there was gonna be a big long wait before this one, which is the assessment. And they said that was it. So anyway, got to this, she said, she looked over all my other stuff. She couldn't see any other contributing factors, psychiatric issues, anything like that. She looked over my initial screening. So she sort of knew a fair amount about me. The psychiatric evaluation was in quite a lot of depth about any struggles I've ever had through my life. So I guess they did learn a lot from that. That was a bit more of a qualitative, I can never say that word, versus quantitative, more like um, a wordy, answer thing whereas this one was a little bit more yes or no which I think is what surprised me so we had a little bit of a chat but then we did the diva 5 which apparently stands for the diagnostic interview with the ADHD in adults so shouldn't that be D I F A I A where's the V is it in the middle of interview like I V and anyway that's where my brain goes I don't know what the V stands for but it's a diva 5 so I'm gonna go through <laughs> some of my answer to some of the questions now and then um, tell you what I kind of said. So I'm, I can't go through the whole thing right now in this video because it is really, really long. Um, but if you would like me to go through the, the whole thing in, entire in its entirety, then that 
will be a very long video. Possibly it might fit better on the podcast. So if you want to head over to my podcast channel, um, which I'll put all the links for below, then that might be a better place for that because that will be a really long, quite a chatty video really, because if I go through all of the questions and then how I answered them, that's going to be a long, long video. So just let me know if you want to see that or if you're quite happy with this general overview, which you might not know until I've said what I'm going to say. So let's just get on with that, shall we? So a selection of the questions. Bear in mind, there are questions where they look for examples in adulthood and there are questions that are specific to examples in childhood. And apparently for it to be ADHD, a lot of this stuff has to be present in childhood and not just adulthood as well, but not all of it. They did say in the psychiatric evaluation that it would be helpful, beneficial to take a parent with you. I explained that wasn't gonna be possible in my case. And they said that was fine. And actually that's quite common with adults. Um, not everyone has parents in their lives. So that was not essential, but it might be helpful. You are going for one of these, especially if your memory of your childhood is a bit sketchy. So examples of adulthood, makes careless mistakes. I mean, my spelling is not dreadful. My typing is pretty bad. And then I just like, I can't see my own errors until I look back with enough distance to read it as if someone else had written it. Then I can see the glaring errors, but when it's my own, I just, it's like I'm blind to them. Works slowly to avoid mistakes. Um, does not read instructions carefully. Like, or some of these, I just, I was there. And as the questions kept coming, I was just like, uh, uh. The answers to these, by the way, were not like sometimes, rarely, never kind of answers. They were just tick or not tick. So it was yes or no. There is a facility to add extra information, but ultimately what goes down on the form is a yes or a no. It gets easily bogged down by details. Ugh, yeah, that's me. Works too quickly and makes mistakes. And yeah, this it's like typos or just being too close to my work. I really do struggle with that. Examples in childhood, making careless mistakes in schoolwork not reading the questions properly, overlooking, missing details, other and general other comments about careless work. Then, then some questions about attention. So in adulthood, just a few of them. And both, all these were based on things that you're not especially interested in. So when I am really hyper-focused on something, I'm really like, excited about a creative project, I can hyper-focus and really just not notice the time, which is why I have a lamp to go and pick up my children and just get really stuck into it. And I just don't focus on anything else at all. I'm really hyper-focused. However, if it's something I'm not so interested in, so for example, I really enjoy doing the creative elements of my job and my videos or when I'm really like, excited about creating a new plan or whatever, that stuff I can focus on no problem. But when it comes to the really boring bitty bits, so like after I've uploaded a video, I've got to fill out tags and descriptions and keywords and blah, SEO stuff. <laughs> I'm just bored to tears. And that's likely where you'll see mistakes or where I will have missed things. I have to have checklists I follow for every video because honestly, I just skip steps. And it's not that in the the interesting bits, in the being creative and making the videos, it's in the upload or just in the checking the final details. That's just something I struggle with so badly. Another one I felt really seen was not being able to sit and watch a film till the end. I cannot just sit and watch TV. I mean, this is me watching TV. I'm up, I'm down, and oh, I think I just need tissue. I think I just need to get my lip balm. Um, oh, who's this? What were they in? Let's look on the IMDB app. Well, was this factually accurate? Oh, what was this? Uh, let's Google that. Or I have to be going to get a drink or going to get a snack. I just can't sit still and just watch a film from beginning to end. It's agony. And then there were lots of questions about how distracted I was as a child. And again, it was very similar for me as a child. When I was interested in something, I just knew everything about it. But then other subjects, I was like, oh, I just, I just tune out. I'm looking at you maths. <laughs> then the next section of questions, and there were just quite a lot of examples in each of these. And like I said, if you want me to go into this in depth, I'll happily do that in another video, but this one will be about three days long if we do it all here. So questions about appearing not to be listening to the person that is supposed to be speaking to you. And in adulthood, do you ever seem dreamy or preoccupied? 
have difficulty concentrating on a conversation. And I do, because sometimes I'm like, oh, I need to say this thing. Okay, I need to wait for the person to finish talking. Okay, don't interrupt. Oh, but hang on, am I gonna forget this thing? Right, don't forget this thing, you've got to tell them this thing. Don't forget this thing, don't forget this thing. Oh God, what are they saying? Oh my goodness, I'm supposed to be listening. Oh no, I haven't been listening to what they've been saying because I've been trying to remember the thing. Oh God, what's the thing I had to say again? <laughs> so <laughs> this, that's like an actual thing that happens inside my brain. So sometimes I do miss what people are saying because I'm so focused on trying to remember the thing I was trying not to forget to say. And then similar questions to how distracted I was as a child. Honestly, my school reports all kind of read, Rhiannon's very bright, I just wish she'd apply herself, pretty much across the board. Then there's some questions about follow through and instructions. One of them was starts tasks but loses focus quickly. I mean, this is literally why I had to design my planner because I need my planner in order to plan what I'm supposed to be doing. But I get so distracted by, and in all fairness, it's not all like non-worky stuff, but even by other worky stuff. So if I'll be in the middle of working on, say, editing a video, and this is especially the case if I'm finding it harder to concentrate because it feels like a big bulky project. So if I'm, if I've got a video and it's four hours long, I need to edit four hours of footage, which that would probably be cut into two videos, but um, I've got four hours of footage to get through from a day, from a Disney day, for example, on my Disney channel. That feels so overwhelming. My brain is likely to go, oh, I've just had this idea for your planner store. Oh, how about you redesign your website? How about this? And my brain just comes up with all these ideas that I just want to put down the thing I'm struggling with because it feels too big and overwhelming and I want to go and do the other thing. So the idea is I force myself to go, no, no, don't go and do the other thing that you want to do, even though it's a good idea write it down and get back on task. And it's something I really struggle with. And then maybe it's just like mum tasks that pop into my head, like, oh, I forgot to pay for the girls dancing or, oh, did I order the lunches for the school or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. And these things pop into my head and it just takes everything in my being to take a pen and write it down. And that's why I've got that notes dump section in my Organised Life and Gratitude Planner. It's for all that brain dump stuff the to-dos go into the to-do list, but then I've got all these ideas and things and it just goes into that place. I feel like my ideas then are safe and they won't like float away into space, which is what I feel happens if I just leave them in my brain. And then questions about being younger and not completing things. And although I did well in school, it was just, it just felt more like a fluke than anything. I just felt like I was blagging it. I was often told I was blagging it. I would often not complete things. In fact, my English teacher, this is really bad, I hope my children don't watch this, but my English teacher, I can remember saying to me in my final year of school for my GCSEs, saying that all the coursework, I think it had to be posted off somewhere. It all had to be submitted by a certain date. And she said to me, I have, haven't had one piece of coursework from you in two years. I mean, there's a whole conversation to be had about why I wasn't nagged about this sooner, but hey-ho. I haven't had any coursework from you in two years and the deadline is the end of the week. And I did two years worth of coursework in one week because I hadn't handed any in for two years. But then when I had a really tight deadline, I pulled it out of the bag and I did it. And I had an A in English, or two A's in English actually, one for language and one for literature. But I hadn't done it for two years, for two years. So yeah, I was not the best at completing things, but working better under a deadline seems to be another ADHD trait. In fact, one of the other question was needing a timeline or a deadline in order to complete a task. And yeah, I mean, I do. I have to give myself arbitrary deadlines in order to complete the work that I have to do. And that came quite easily when I announced when I started my YouTube channel, videos were gonna be, well, originally it was Tuesdays, Thursdays and Sundays at 7 p.m., wasn't it? If you think way back to when I started doing YouTube properly. Then it moved to Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. on my main channel and Disney's on my, Sunday slot and then I moved all the times around so now it's Tuesdays and Thursdays at 5 p.m and Saturdays on my Disney channel at 8 a.m just to confuse things but ultimately having that accountability having to get things done by those dates those videos have to go out by those dates does give me a deadline which means that those things have to be done however other things like I mean how long did I talk about launching planner store before I actually did it was it a year and it wasn't until I gave myself deadlines there that it actually happened and then, they, then there's questions about organization. Now, I've had comments from people in, in the comments um, saying, but really, you're really organized, you can't possibly have ADHD. But then a lot of the stuff that I've put in place, in fact, all of the stuff I've put in place, I have put to counteract my naturally muddled brain. So I thought when 
I was trying to, you know, improve my organization. I thought I was just trying to hack mum life. And the more I've learned about this, the more I'm like, oh, have I just been trying to hack? Yes, mum life is busy. Yes, as mums, we have way too much knock cognitive loads. But am I actually trying to hack ADHD? Possibly, because yes, I have a lot in place to keep me organized. I have alarms going off all day on my phone, alarms for time to get up, time to bring children downstairs for breakfast, time for end of breakfast, time for getting shoes on for school, time to nearly wrap up for work to go and get the children, time to actually leave to go and get the children, time to pick up the children from karate. All these alarms go off and I have a lot in place to help keep me organized. And honestly, I just thought it was stuff that would help everyone. And I guess it is. I think it would help everyone, but I think it might help people with ADHD quite a lot more. than um, maybe some neurotypical people don't need it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and then there's um, a section about avoiding doing things that you dislike. And I've always been terrible for procrastination, which is why now in recent years, probably in the last 10 years, I'm so all about eat the frog because I have to push myself so hard to do the things I don't want to do first. Otherwise, I will never do them ever. And therefore the eat the frog thing has become a bit of my mantra so if I've got like a disgusting job I hate doing like my tax stuff it just makes me want to just peel my own skin off it just like so boring so just don't want to do it it's it's not fun for anyone is it it's just I don't know one of those things I think everyone has jobs like that in their work they're like oh no like give me the creative stuff give me the the fun bits um, I don't know, maybe maybe for some people then doing like the websites or the creative stuff would be hell and they would love doing the books. I don't know, I guess everyone's different. But for me, things like that, I used to procrastinate that stuff so badly and I just wouldn't want to look at it and then I'd get myself in a tiz because it wasn't done and then I'd be panicking and now I just hate that feeling so much that I had for such a long time about being so disorganized, about falling behind in those things, that I've put things in place to avoid that as much as possible. So naturally I and I put it down to my upbringing a lot that I was just brought up to procrastinate um but then I guess did the adults in my life have potentially similar difficulties I don't know I don't know who am I to say that <laughs> and then there's a the thing about losing stuff and I'm just honestly I spent so much of this time going oh <laughs> awkward laugh I feel so seen so losing things my my honestly the thing I use my Apple Watch for the most is when you press this button here and it goes, oh, there's my phone. And my husband would be like, what is the matter with you? Your phone's right there. You just pinged it. Like, how have you lost your phone again? I've always been blamed the patriarchy and lack of pockets, but I don't know. I just, I do lose things quite a lot. And the other thing I'm really bad for doing is it's like puzzle pieces go missing in the sequence of events in my memory. So... For example, the children had a basket of Easter crafts and they were just all the bits that I'd found um, when we were getting them done for Easter. And I turned the place upside down so looking for these Easter crafts. I looked in my seasonal boxes in my calyx that I had and it's like, well, this is where I would have put them. I emptied these boxes specifically. I went through these boxes over and over and over and over. Couldn't find them anywhere. I looked in my office. I looked in all the places they could be. How did I put them? Where did I put them? And then when I found them, I'd like just popped them underneath the children's desk. I don't know why I'd put them there. It was a stupid place to put them. But when I found them then, I was like, oh yeah, I remember doing that now. But for the life of me, could I find these things? And it had not been that long since I'd seen them. And this is the kind of story that happens all the time. So I'll open something from Amazon and then I will, like, I don't know, I'll like absentmindedly like chuck it in a washing basket to carry it upstairs because it needs to go up there. And then I can't find it because I've put another washing basket on top of it. And I look for it for days and it's not until I then sort out whatever basket it was in or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's what I did with it. And I can remember that and I can remember putting it there and I feel very silly, but losing things, I mean, constantly, constantly, constantly. Yeah, that's that's a big one. And then there are questions about being distracted. And again, there are very specific questions for adults and for children, but just generally, how distracted do I get? Oh, I used to really struggle when I worked in an office environment with loads of different people. I found that really, really, really challenging. And I work so much better when I'm working home alone, even if there's someone else in the house and I can just hear them like pottering around, I'm far more likely to be distracted. So yeah, I do find distractions quite a big challenge. 
I have to actively put my phone, I have focus modes on my phone so I can stop all messages pinging through. Otherwise, if I, I mean, to be fair, there are a lot of WhatsApp groups that I'm on for school. If I looked at my phone every time someone actually sent a message on a WhatsApp group, I wouldn't get any work done at all. But then it would take me such a long time to get back to what I'm supposed to be doing. And the times I do have to pick up my phone and post something to Instagram for work or find a photograph that I took on a trip that I need to put in a video, I'll pick up my phone and I'm like, oh yeah, there's something else. And I get lost in something and then I'm like, oh God, I picked that up to do something specific. What was it? Yeah, I am really easily distracted. And then there are questions about how forgetful I am. And I mean, I've talked endlessly about how everything in my life goes on a calendar or a phone reminder. I decode those calendar reminders weekly into my planner. I mean, maybe other people don't need to do all this in order to just remember what they're supposed to be doing, where they're supposed to be and who needs to pack lunch and things. Maybe some people can hold it all in their brains and just execute all of that easily, but I definitely can't. And I thought that was just mum life. I genuinely thought I've just got too much going on in my life. I've got too many children in order to hold it all in my brain. And that's why my brain feels like tangled spaghetti. But maybe not everyone feels like that. Then there's stuff about um, being able to sit still and how fidgety you are. Now, if you were to ever watch me working at my desk, I do not sit properly like a grown up. I am sitting on my feet, I've got my feet up on things. I am really quite fidgety. I'm not as like bouncing off the walls, hyperactive as you would traditionally think of with ADHD. It's, but then a friend of mine who actually got in touch having watched um, my last video, I haven't seen her for ages, she's moved away and she said she'd be, recently been diagnosed and she said that she spoke to her consultant when she was diagnosed with it. And she's like, oh, but surely I don't have the hyperactive bit because I'm not bouncing off the walls. And he said that actually generally in women, the hyperactive bit is more like your brain's like, doesn't stop. Just your brain is like on the go, on the go, on the go. Your brain is hyperactive. But, you know, on the surface to everyone else, you seem to be able to sit still. And it's that kind of hyperactive brain is the way it can generally present in women, apparently. And there's questions about being restless and how hard I find it to relax. And I've talked about this before. I really, I don't know, I always put it down to just having too much on my plate in order to be able to relax. But if I think about it, even if I have made a decision that I have to shelve things because I'm ill, like even when I was recovering from my um, surgical procedure and things, I really struggle to relax just mentally relax. Yoga is a real challenge for me. I think this is why I'm adamant to keep doing it. Although I must admit, I sometimes slash quite often do yoga while listening to an audiobook because I just struggle to quiet my mind down. I just don't understand how people do it. You know, when they say quiet your mind, I don't get how, to, I, it's not something I understand how to do. And then there's examples of, um, talking a lot which obviously I do which is kind of helpful for my job which is talking to you lovely people an example um it talked about an example in childhood about always putting your hand up and that yeah that was always me it was always I was always like this one put my hand up ask a question answer a question that was always me and then questions about always being on the go and always having to be doing something and and just generally being constantly busy seeming restless I definitely identify with this and all these different questions, honestly, the number of times I was like, yep, yep, that one's well, yep. But I just, honestly, I thought this was, I guess it's not a word we should use, but you know, normal. I thought, I thought this is how everyone was when they were mum, they had lots on. Then there are questions about talking excessively. And yeah, I mean, I probably do that. It's quite awkward to admit, but yeah, I probably do that. And one of the ones that specifically that struck out was being referred to as a chatterbox, as a child. And that was definitely, like, that was something I was actually called. Then there was a question about blurting out answers. And this is something I really have to fight the urge to do. And I know that I should not blurt out and interrupt people. And it's definitely something I have to fight the urge to do. It's, um, again, a bit awkward and embarrassing, really. But, yeah, I think it comes back to the, if I don't say it now, I'm going to forget. Or just being overly enthusiastic about agreeing with someone or whatever it might be. But, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah awkward but yeah that's something that definitely relates then there are questions about being impatient and oh, when I've decided I want to do something I want it done yesterday this is the problem and I think this is something I really struggle with um so I've been having some business coaching lately which has been really really fun and I've had all these really great ideas and the thing I struggle with is knowing how to prioritize something and to spread things out so like I've had all these great ideas amazing right I'll do one this month one next month I just want it all done yesterday and Yes, I am very impatient from what, from that point of view. Um, 
enthusiastic, I like to call it, but yes, quite impatient. My husband always laughs about this because I like, when I decided I wanted to, I don't know, like, like swap my office around then. He's like, oh, I thought you were only just thinking about it. It's like, nope, I've already ordered all the furniture. I'll be here tomorrow. Can you assemble it as soon as it comes here, please? <laughs> and then he's like, so you just want that done straight away the moment it arrives? I'm like, if that's at all possible, yes, please. Luckily, he's quite impatient too, so he understands where I'm coming from there. Um, but yes, I am quite impatient. So like I said, this, obviously I'm skimming over a lot of these questions because there were multiple questions in each of these sections, but hopefully it's giving you a general overview of the types of things. Um, but the sort of the last section asks you to identify where you've had struggles. So things like, did you not complete education? Are you working at level below your education? Do you tire quickly of workplace or pattern of many short term jobs? Or one of the answers was limited impairment in this area due to high IQ. So when I was in school, specifically because both of these questions were applied to adulthood and childhood, I did better in school than I should have done for the amount of work I put in. So the amount of work I put in was really, really minimal. And I was very lucky to still have done quite well, which is why I think I was always told that I blagged things, because I guess I did. I did not necessarily deserve to have done well. I was just lucky that I'd managed to, I just put it all down to good exam technique, but it wasn't till I got further up through to university. And I, you know, I still, I got my degree, did well, but I never excelled in the way I wish I had, if I'd really been able to apply myself, which I honestly did not fully apply myself to my full potential in any of my school or university education, which is kind of sad, really. Um, like I got through it, but I did not apply myself, but ne nor was I encouraged to. And I think this is where I've kind of parented my children in a different way than I'm like, look, you might not want to do this now, but as your parent, I owe it to you to make sure you knuckle down and do the best that you can. And although our eldest wasn't best chuffed with me at the time, is now really grateful that I made him do that because he came out with exceptional grades at GCSE and A level. So I think being guided through things would have definitely helped me a lot more as a child. And then there are questions about relationships and how symptoms have impacted those. Questions about how symptoms have impacted social contacts how they've impacted you in free time and hobbies, like how easy do you find it to relax how, or do you pick up new hobbies and then bore them very quickly? <laughs> like, yeah, you've done that a number of times over the years. And then questions about self-confidence and self-image. Do I struggle with perfectionism? Which actually might just be procrastination. Yes, I really do. Which sounds really contradictory to the making careless mistakes, but I honestly struggle with both. Like I want things to be perfect and then I have to kind of go, no, that has to be, that has to just be done is better than best to move on but it is definitely a struggle because ultimately so many times I haven't wanted to get started. Like even with filming videos, sometimes I will sit there and be like fiddling around with the planning and writing more notes and stuff. I can't even get started because I can't really feel like it's right to get started. I haven't planned it properly. And then that is a bit of a challenge. And then things like an excessive and intense re reaction to criticism. I am such a people pleaser and I care far too much about what other people think and I really am trying to work on that because I know that's not healthy, but that is something I struggle with pretty much my whole life. So we went through this incredibly long questionnaire, this Diva 5, and then she said, right, okay, so next steps are the physical examination and then medication. So I was like, oh, okay, um, so when do I, you know, get the results if I need a diagnosis or, and she said, oh, you do, you have, you have ADHD with the hyperactivity. <laughs> The mixed, I think. Did she call it the mixed? In fact, she gave me a bit of paper, which I instantly said, I'm going to have to take a photograph of this so I don't lose it. And she said, no, you can just stick it on your fridge. I'm like, no, I have to take a photo of it because it may not make it as far as the fridge. I will probably lose it. I've not lost it yet, so I'm quite pleased there. Um, so she said, right, the ADHD pathway was the general interview and the psychiatric evaluation, the Diva 5, which is the thing we just did, then the physical health, then medication. And that's it. So... Yeah, I've been diagnosed with ADHD. I have ADHD. Um, how do I feel about that? Honestly, relieved. Like, it makes so much sense. Like, why I am the way I am. And I think it's going to be easier to be kind to myself. I definitely, definitely with hindsight, when I think back of, you know, like when I struggle with things when I was younger, 
things like not applying myself, not really achieving my true potential, which I beat myself up about a bit, then it all just makes so much sense. Honestly, I now wonder why I was so worried. No, what was I worried about? I was worried about wasting people's time. I thought I'd go in there and they'd be like, oh, you don't have ADHD. What are you doing here wasting our time? Now, obviously they weren't actually going to say that, but I think my subconscious worried that they might. And that probably comes back to um, having that experience maybe with that particularly awful um, male registrar gynecologist that really made me feel pooey when he's like, oh, so just having heavy bleeding, are we? Why is that such a big deal? And I wanted to say, no, you trust no opinion. But yeah, I think having had experiences of being belittled by other medical health professionals, I think that was a bit of a concern. It was, it was all very, you know, she was lovely and it was all quite straightforward. And then of course, just the stress that came with the children's autism assessments. Um, incidentally, I did say, so this just ADHD or autism? She said, no, not autism. We're not looking at autism here, just ADHD. So that was really interesting. I know some people did say in the comments they thought maybe they kind of spotted a bit of autism with me as well. Also before today I did do an autism screening and my screening results came back as no, very unlikely to have autism. So that was really, really interesting. And honestly that kind of stacks. I kind of know quite a lot about autism and now I've about ADHD since I've been researching it over the last couple of years. And definitely I feel that my challenges and struggles align far more with ADHD than with autism. I had a lot of people saying, what difference do I think it will make? Um, ultimately, being able to understand myself, I would say is massive. And just being able to know which strategies I'm gonna be able to put in place to help myself even more. Ultimately hack productivity even more because we know, the more we know about ourselves, the more we can hack our lives to make them better and easier and get more done in the time we're trying to get things done so we can have more free, enjoyable time and just be kinder to ourselves. And ultimately, setting an example to my kids, really, that if you've got something that you're worried about with your own health or something that may help you, that it's worth seeking professional opinions. Because I hope if they have any, I don't know, mental health, physical health, anything struggles as they grow up and they're no longer a child under my care, that they can take themselves to, to get the care they need, which I know is something that traditionally mums especially struggle to do. So hopefully I'm setting a good example for them as they get older. Ultimately, what would I say to someone else that has any concerns, if anything I've said today has kind of spoken to them, I would just say see your GP and have a conversation because I'm genuinely so glad I did. I feel kind of lighter, like everything makes so much sense. Don't let imposter syndrome hold you back and worry about being laughed out of the place because I worried about that. And honestly, like even if they had said, oh, there's nothing up here, it still would have been the right thing to check because otherwise I would have been niggling. Like same with the children, I would have been going back and forth and back and forth. Oh, is it this? Is it not? Do I parent them like this? Do I do this? Ultimately, knowledge is power and understanding yourself, understanding your children, understanding the people in your lives so that you can know how to treat people better, how to maximize people's experience to make their lives easier. That's what it's all about. And yeah, ultimately, I started my channel trying to share all the ways I've been trying to make mum life easier making parenting easier, have I just been trying to make life as an adult, a now 40 year old woman, just been diagnosed, still can't call myself a woman actually, 40 year old girl, 40 year old woman, 40 year old person, <laughs> I still don't feel grown up enough to refer to myself as a woman just between me and you, but as a 40 year old, has just, having just been diagnosed with ADHD, have I just been trying to hack ADHD all this time? Probably. <laughs> So if you've got any questions at all, please do leave them below. Um, I will do deep dive videos on anything that, that people are interested in hearing about, either here or over on my podcast channel. So make sure you are subscribed to the podcast channel as well as this channel, just so that if you're interested in any of the content about ADHD, some of it will be here and some of the more chatty conversations will happen on the podcast channel. So this morning I have got a doctor's appointment I guess a medical appointment the only reason I pursued an assessment really was for understanding just I just wanted to understand how my own brain worked and I wanted to know do I need to give myself this grace and you know I just wanted to know which strategies to put in place that kind of thing the same way that I want to understand my children I want them to be able to understand themselves I want to be able to understand myself I think I was a little surprised and shocked that in that appointment they were like, oh, well, next step is meds. And I was like, I don't know, I was really, really blindsided because it's not something I'd even considered. So they said, next step is a physical examination and then another appointment where we prescribe you this medication. And I went away and I thought about it because initially I was like, oh, no. And I thought, well, 
is it silly not to at least explore it? So that's what I'm doing. I've still not made a decision about ADHD medication. I am very open-minded to hearing the information. I feel it would be very closed-minded of me not to at least explore it. And if it can help me and make my life easier, if it can make me more productive during my work time so that I have that free time to spend with my family, I'm not constantly feeling like I'm on a hamster wheel, that's gonna be beneficial. So, long story short, today in, not very long actually, so I've gotta get out of the car and start walking, um, but in not very long at all, um, I have got this physical examination, which I'm guessing is gonna be very straightforward. I can't imagine it's gonna be anything exciting. I'm assuming it's, height, weight, blood pressure kind of stuff. I don't really know, but I will uh, go find out right now and let you know. How's that? You okay? You comfy there? Cool. So um, it wasn't what I was expecting at all. I think I thought they'd take my blood pressure. They did. I was expecting that. Um, I thought they were going to probably weigh me. They did. The number was a little higher than I'm used to if I'm honest, but I have been not making healthy choices lately and I'm going to be making some healthier choices. So we're gonna talk about that in a second. So anyway, yeah, they weighed me. I was expecting that. I wasn't expecting to do an ECG. Now an ECG, um, so I think some Apple Watch, I think my Apple Watch or maybe my husband's Apple Watch can do an ECG, but it's not like the ECG that the NHS do, it's not. So the ECG that the NHS do, they stick a lot of stickers all over you. I think they put one on maybe each foot and the problem was, and this is why I wish someone had said they're gonna do an ECG, um, and the, the whole basis of this um, appointment was my next appointment, I believe, is to get a prescription for medication. And like I said, I'm not 100% deciding what I'm doing about that, but I'm going along and learning about the benefits and maybe I'll try it, maybe I won't, I don't know. That's, that's a whole conversation for another day. But the purpose of today's was to check that my body was physically fit, to check that I had no blood pressure issues. Don't know why I'm pointing my arm, I guess, because they stuck the arm thing on. To check I've got no blood pressure issues. My blood pressure is always teetering on the low side. Um, so that's cool. And to check I've got no heart problems because if you have blood pressure or heart problems, then ADHD medication may make that worse. And I believe if you're on ADHD medication, you have to go back and have this stuff done uh, every six months. So ECG, the reason it was a problem, <laughs> they kind of looked at me and went, oh, we're gonna need to access here. I said, that's fine, I can just do this. But also here. So they needed to stick, <laughs> stick these sticky tabs kind of here and here. So the long story short is I wish someone had told me you're gonna need an ECG and don't wear a dress, you need to wear like a two piece. Cause if you've got a two piece, it's like you can do this, you know? Um, it's a bit like when you don't really think about it when you go for like your first pregnancy scans and if you're wearing a dress and no leggings and you've got to like lift the whole thing up and you sit in there in your pants. It's a bit like that. So I had to pull my dress all the way up so they could do this ECG. I mean, it was fine. And quite frankly, after you've had a baby and you've had everything on display and you know, your dignity goes totally out the window. Small things like that or smear dust or whatever, just don't phase me. But I, if someone had told me, you're gonna need an ECG and they're gonna have to stick tabs under your boobs and if you wear a separate, you know, like jeans and a top or leggings and a top or even a skirt and a top, then you're not gonna have to sit there flashing your pants, then that's information I wish I'd had. So if you are going for an ECG or if you're going for an ADHD medical appointment and you don't know if you're gonna to have to have an ECG, but you might, don't wear a dress. So that's um, that's my little takeaway from that. Right, so today I am off to my appointment for ADHD medication. When I was diagnosed for ADHD, even when I was in the process of getting assessed, I didn't want to get assessed so that I could get medication. In fact, I was very much like, no, I don't want medication, I just want to understand my own brain. Which is, you know, fine. So someone said to me, if you were diagnosed with diabetes, would you say no to insulin? And that made a lot of sense. In fact, I've said this sort of thing previously before this comment, when talking about uh, mental health and antidepressants and things. It's not something I've ever needed, but when talking to other people in my life, my attitude's always very much been, why is there a stigma to this? And I always very much want the mental health side of medicine to catch up to the physical health side. My 
goal has always been that when the children are older, hopefully the whole society will catch up so that it's like, okay, so you got a bad leg, get the doctors, if you know, you're suffering with mental health, get the help the same way, no stigma. But then I think I was just like, oh, I'm fine. I don't need it. But then it seemed such a given when I was diagnosed. She's like, okay, next step is medication. And I thought about it and thought about it. And I just thought, where's the harm in trying? Because I don't know how much it will help. Now, obviously, if it doesn't make much difference and I have loads of negative side effects, I am functioning in my life. So I don't want it if it's going to make me feel worse in any way. But I'll only know that if I try. On the other hand, it might be the best thing ever happened to me. I don't know because I haven't tried. So I'm going to go to this appointment. I'm going to learn about it. I'm going to see what they have to say. And I'm going to decide based on that information, not based on some, I don't know, something in my head, in my head I had that was like, no, I don't need that. Well, I think the open-minded thing to do is to find out. Back in the car now, which is like a flipping furnace, by the way. Not that I'm complaining about the nice weather, the nice weather fleet today, but you know, I just, just get some air in here. I'm going to say the same thing I've said when coming out of every single one of my ADHD appointments so far, which is, that's not what I expected. Gosh, it's noisy, so I'm gonna have to close these windows and just burn on time, just gonna have to just burn up. Yeah, it's just not what I expected at all. So I went in, I walked in, there was a student with it, normally through my ex extensive um, interactions with the medical community, although most of those would be through um, having babies, so mostly with midwives. They'd always be like, I've got a student with me, is that okay? Because I've got to say, other than um, pregnancy related stuff, I've not had much to do with the hospital. She didn't bother to introduce the student, which I thought was weird. Anyway, um, she went through, she said how, uh, she said, oh, you had your physical I said yeah I did have my physical oh by the way can you please start telling people not to wear a dress to the physical because if you watch that blog where I went to that you have to have an ECG and they have to put like stickers here like under your bra all sorts of places so in effect you've got to pull your dress up and I was sitting there in my pants put my denim jacket over my lap but I was in effect sitting there in my pants she honestly looked at me like I had two heads it's like you know because you need to do the ECG and it would be good to advise people yeah she continued to look at me like I had two heads so I just I dropped that one anyway she said um she went through my results which on the day they said were fine but I've written it down because I can't remember what it said she said my BP was 119 over 87 and she said anything over 90 on the bottom number is considered high blood pressure now I've normally got bonkers low blood pressure to which I replied Maybe my blood pressure was up because I was sitting there in my pants. She didn't appreciate that either. Anyway, she also said, I've written this down a separate note apparently. She also said that my ECG was mostly okay other than it had, and I don't know what this means, I've got to Google it, a short PR interval. Or was it a PRE interval? I'm going to have to Google that and see what earth that is. But basically, she said she wants to give me the medication. She's happy to. She asked, how's my anxiety? It's like, well, I don't really suffer with anxiety so just like basically checking am I anxious am I depressed all the things it's like no I'm fine um short p r heart condition heart rhythm maybe a short p r interval of less than 120 ms may be associated with pre excitation syndrome such as wolf parkinson white syndrome or lone Ganon Levin syndrome. Oh, great. Also, junctional arrhythmia. I don't know what any of that means. Is short PR life threatening? I shouldn't Google stuff, should I? When is it length is less than. I don't know what its length was. What is short PR interval? Oh, gosh, I'm going to have to Google all this a bit more. She basically said she didn't think it was worrying at all, but she's going to have to pass it over to a cardiologist. So she's supposed to be just giving me a prescription now. She's like, no, I'll get it. I'll run it past a cardiologist. It should be fine. Nothing to worry about. I wouldn't worry about it with me. It's like, okay, but now you have to run it past a cardiologist. So, in effect, I need to go and Google what on earth this is. Although Dr. Google's never helpful. Maybe I should speak to an actual doctor I know. Oh, I don't know. Um, maybe I should just ignore it until it comes 
back with the results. Anyway, if this problem that they found with the ECG, the cardiologist doesn't think is a, is a real big problem, and they will send me the prescription in the post. And apparently the prescriptions get sent out every 30 days, or I could go and collect them, but it's quite a long way from my house, so there's only chance it could be sent. But apparently every 28 days you have to ring them and ask them to post it. That doesn't seem a very sensible system, does it? Because if you need it every 30 days, and then you're relying on the person being in. Like this appointment was rescheduled from last week because this woman was off sick. But it's relying on someone being there and actually being able to post it on time, relying on the post and being able to pick things up in time. When your medication's supposed to be consistent, that doesn't seem a very reliable system to me, just as a bit of a thinking out loud. So anyway, I honestly thought I'd be walking away, clutching a prescription today and going away, oh, I don't know, or just, having more information in the appointment about the medication i don't know i don't know what i thought it's not this isn't what i thought okay what else did she say she said the short pr interval she said that uh the medication should be prescribing me i should take every eight to ten hours with a big breakfast because it's likely my she said i should take it with a big breakfast not because it'll make me sick or anything because something's going to take on a full stomach but because i'm unlikely to feel hungry afterwards uh, because apparently it creates diminished appetite and she also said that if I've got a blood pressure monitor at home I should monitor my blood pressure twice a day for the next week to see if my blood pressure is becoming high. I must admit I didn't have any anxiety or stress until now and until they said there was something wrong with the thing and need blood pressure. It's not helping my blood pressure. Anyway, um, it's probably fine. It's probably nothing. It's probably... I don't know. The most sensible thing to do would have been like take my blood pressure again now. She didn't have blood pressure one, did she? No, she didn't. Oh well, I'm just gonna go home and process all this. The other thing is with all this cardiology talk, I forgot to ask her. I still haven't had a letter or anything confirming my diagnosis. I haven't had I just feel like when the children had autism assessments, we had like a really in-depth report. It was really insightful. And it was helpful and I was kind of hoping for something like that but I totally forgot to ask because I was all flummoxed over this cardiology. Um, still haven't had a prescription for my ADHD medication. I still haven't had any update on my ECG. If you missed that, I mean if you missed the whole story then there's a whole place explaining my whole ADHD journey but the short version is um, I was supposed to be prescribed medication for ADHD. I had an ECG and at my last meeting they had concerns about something on my ECG, something about a PR interval, I'm not even sure. I don't know, I'm not a cardiologist and I've given up consulting Dr. Google because let's face it, it's very much doom and gloom when you do that. So I phoned up, they won't give me any answers over the phone, but I have got an appointment, well I had a text message to say I had an appointment and I phoned up and I said, um, I've had a text message to say I've got an appointment coming up. And the very rude lady on the phone was like, we don't send text messages, like, well I've got one. Can you just check, please? She's like, oh, you have got an appointment. So can you tell me what it's about? No, I can't. Okay. I was like, well, I was told I'd just be posted the prescription. We don't post prescriptions. Okay. Well, that's what the doctor said. The doctor wouldn't have said that. I was like, okay, but she did. So anyway, I wasn't getting anywhere with her at all. I've got an appointment coming up. I don't know what this is about. I'm assuming it's to say your ECG is fine. Assuming, hoping. Your ECG is fine. Here's a prescription. And then I guess I just try it. And I was really like, I don't need medication. But then... I've always said if you need something for something you can't see, like if you're depressed, don't be like, oh, I don't want to take antidepressants. Because if you had diabetes, you wouldn't be like, I want to, I don't want to take insulin. So I know this is not exactly the same thing, but I don't know how much of a difference it would make or how much I struggle until I try it, if you know what I mean. So it's like how much of what I do could be so much easier. Anyway, I just, I just thought it would be silly not to try. So... I'm gonna go and see what they have to say. I've just parked for this, um, I'm assuming ADHD appointment. I've got no idea what it's for. I just had this text. I'm gonna show up. I'm, I'm hoping it's, yay, everything in the ECG is fine. Here's a prescription and here's a really easy means of getting a repeat prescription every month that does not involve coming all the way back, which is another way from where you live and um, takes ages and faffy. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah, I, just, I guess we'll just go figure out. I'll report back when I'm out. Well, that was the biggest waste of time ever. Um, 
it's not the doctors in the NHS, it's the organisation. Uh, I know we're very lucky to have the NHS, we're very lucky to have, you know, to have the whole system. I get that. But the disorganisation, this is where, like, that appointment was a total waste of time for that doctor. I did not need to be there, I've just wasted their time. Because she couldn't give me a prescription, it was supposed to be to give, she booked, she told the, her secretary to book her an appointment in a month after the first one. So this is a month after that one where I had that funny ECG. And she referred it off to a cardiologist. They still haven't heard back. So she's like, I'm really sorry um, that you're here because there's like, I can't give you the prescription, but are you feeling okay? I'm like, well, I'm feeling the same as before. Like, So that's, yeah, that's wasted my time. That's totally wasted her time. She could have been seeing someone else because the cardiologist hadn't written back and they need this sign off. So she's asked me now to go to my own GP to book in an ECG. So I phoned to book an ECG, she said, uh, the spoke to the secretary of my practice and she said as it happens we've got a cancellation for an ECG this afternoon so I'm going to go to have this ECG fingers crossed everything is perfect and then supposed to phone this doctor put the I hope she answers the phone because I just did try phoning it and she's not the phone um put the person doing the ECG on the phone and then she can write me the prescription straight away and I just have to go and pick it up she said the other thing I need I could do is ask my GP to chase the cardiologist or to phone and pass the cardiologist myself. Um, so I understand there's a big backlog, but really that appointment didn't need to happen. They could have given it to someone else. So, right, off to now my GP, hopefully have a totally clear ECG. I'm hoping that that last one was some weird fluke because they also said my blood pressure was high and I honestly don't believe it is. I've taken it since myself when it's been low. So yeah. <laughs> Let's go and um, we'll see if we can get any sense. Well, today has been what can only be described as a wild goose chase. So I went, luckily my GP put me in for an ECG. Great. It was like much more of an naked ECG than my last one. So thank goodness I had a skirt and top on. I, somewhere in the back of my mind I was like, mm, maybe I'll have to repeat it. Let's wear a skirt and top. But this time it didn't even, I like, wasn't allowed to even strip down to my bra because I'm wearing like um one of these like sports bra tops like the ones I work out in that are like somewhere between a bra and a shop and doing my clothes I had to just off totally anyway it's fine it's fine that was fine um the nurse doing the ECG was lovely she said it was totally fine totally normal well no, no sorry tell her she go to the doctor the doctor had to say she wasn't allowed to say anything to the doctor so the doctor signed it off totally normal I said great can I phone this doctor like my ADHD doctor and put you on the phone which is what she's asked me to do so you can tell her that. No, we don't do that. We don't make outgoing calls because of data protection or something. Okay. So the doctor's given me a, the physical ECG and signed it to say it's absolutely fine. So I phoned and spoke to my ADHD doctor, I guess it's a consultant. My consultant, let's just say, with both the consultant. Um, and I said, I've got this ECG. And she said, right, great, bring it back. So bear in mind, this is like quite a distance between my GP and the other one bring it back or post it and I can sort out the prescription for you. I said, great, I'll drive it down now. So I phoned my husband, so I'm not going to be back for ages because I've got to carry on with my wild goose chase. So I said, can I see this doctor to physically give it to her? She wouldn't come out, um, which is fine. Maybe she's busy, whatever. But she, so I said, fine, I'll wait because I want to make sure that she has it and then hopefully she can just do the prescription for me. She said she'd be able to do it straight away. And then they eventually came back with, oh, it's too late now, we're closing. And they want some other doctor to look at the ECG anyway. And it's just like, the hoops to jump through. Like, I did everything she wanted me to do. She said it was no problem, she'd write the prescription. Now she's like, oh, she'll just phone me on Monday. Um, it's quite a way away. I'll have all the children on Monday. It's just... It hurts my head thinking about all the people that need appointments, that need medication, that can't get it because there are appointments being wasted when some results aren't in. So that rather than saying let your results aren't in, let's cancel the appointment. That's what they should have done and stop wasting everyone's time and giving that appointment to someone else. And then I've been back and forth. The GP could not understand why the consultant couldn't just repeat the ECG. It's like the right hand does not know what the left is doing. And I said, well, we'll, we'll always just be like on my medical records somewhere now like if will that just be input can you just like look on a computer and see all the things that have ever happened to me let me know it doesn't work like that so long very very long story short I think I've still got to wait for some other doctor to look at this ECG even though my doctor has signed it off and said it's fine 
there's nothing wrong with it. He's having to have medication, but he can't prescribe it. So I feel a bit overwhelmed now. I feel almost a bit teary and I don't know why, because that's a very silly overreaction. Um, but today's just been, I think it's just very reminiscent of the battles I've had to do with my children over the years. And I know this one isn't, it's, it's just for me. It's not for children. It's like, whatever. But should it be this difficult? Should it? Really? I, I don't know. I didn't, I think I was just looking forward to giving this medication a try. I think I was just looking forward to feeling less foggy in my brain and feeling normal. That's a terrible thing to say really, but maybe I think I was looking forward to trying it and maybe things feeling a bit easier. So I know I'll get it eventually and it's just I think I was, um, I've always thought I'm fine, I don't need medication, but it's quite possible I'll try this and so many people report trying it and being like, wow, this is what it's like for other people. It doesn't have to be difficult all the time. Maybe, a, you know, being able to just like work on something that isn't a hyper focus um, and just plod through it until it's finished without wanting to do a million other different things. Anyway, shake it off. I'm home now and feeling a little calmer um, after having <laughs> not even been able to get the app work to work to get out the car park. I was just, I think my brain was just not functioning. Functioning was shutting down, but I rolled down the windows and listened to some music driving on the way home and I feel a bit calmer. I think the reason I feel so emotional about all this is yes, it's very triggering to having to fight, fight, fight for my children for all their autism stuff. I think it's like, like memories pull up like memories, don't they? And I think that's why I feel a bit ugh about it all. I feel like I've wasted the time. I could have spent, you know, it's the summer holidays. My husband's had to take half a day off work to look after them. I could have spent lovely time with them or I could have got some work done myself. Either would have been great. So it feels wasteful. And I'm definitely sad for all the time that's been wasted today, all those people that are sitting on waiting lists, someone could have had that appointment today. Nothing has been achieved today. So I have been to the first place, way down to the other place, back again, and I'm no further forward. So I may as well have done none of it. I may as well have got some work done. They may as well have given the appointment to someone else. And it just, it makes me sad for, for all those people that are waiting. And, you know, I even phoned up to ask, are you sure I need this appointment? I thought I was just, you know, picking a prescription. Do I need to, do I need to come to this appointment? And like, the snotty secretary on the phone was like, oh, I don't know what it's called. That would have, they should have just cancelled it. Anyway, we're not dwelling on it. We're just, just needs highlighting. Highlighting how clunky the system is, how messy, how many things are just, could be smoother and then they could see and help more people so I guess I'll just have to wait to see what she says on Monday wait she said before you've managed 40 years without it what's a few more weeks like, well, I won't know until I get the medication really I'm hoping it'll make the bits of my life that I struggle with that I manage with systems and lists and that less of a struggle and I was really looking forward to that today. But I guess I'm going to let that go. And what will be will be. And I'm sure it will be sorted out eventually. We hope. <laughs> so it's a few days later. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that things improved the whole situation. I managed to speak yesterday to my doctor. Who said she'd had a sign off from the cardiologist. So I don't know if that means a new person looked at the ECG I handed in a few days ago or if the original cardiologist came back to her I don't know um, but either way it was all signed off and she said there was a prescription there for me to pick up which my husband went to pick up for me so I actually had the prescription yesterday but it's something you're supposed to take after breakfast and I didn't want to 
start taking it at the wrong time of day because apparently if you take it too late it can affect you sleeping so I thought I needed to give it a fair go and try it on a fresh day so that means today's the day I'm going to start this medication now I am excited for the potential improvements that I could have from it I'm a little nervous about potential side effects specifically impacting my sleep hopefully that won't happen if I take it early enough in the day um, apparently people can feel quite anxious as it's wearing off later in the day so obviously that wouldn't be terribly pleasant and one of the things I guess I'm concerned about is lack of creativity I don't know if this is a thing or not I'm gonna have to just take the medication report back but I wonder if I've sort of come to the conclusion since having my diagnosis that some of my creative thinking and my ideas I get are perhaps because of my ADHD so will I feel like I'm getting fewer creative ideas while the medication's working I think the the good thing about it the thing that um kind of if that is true makes me worry about it less is that the medication has a reasonably short for a time frame to work so apparently the medication I've been given will last for about six to eight hours so even if I have to do my creative thinking before I take the medication and then perhaps act on it and perhaps action the stuff while I'm more feeling more focused maybe that'll be the way around it but really it's all conjecture until I get going which I'm gonna to do today. So if you wanna know how my first seven days on ADHD medication went, click on the video on screen now and that'll tell you everything that you need to know. And if you wanna hang out with me a bit more, check out my Patreon and I'll see you in that video.